Well, good morning and welcome to City Church and welcome to 2023. Uh, we hope the Lord shines down on you this year unless you're the type of person who shoots fireworks in the following days, following the holidays. Uh, we hope he shapes you through adversity and go Gators. Uh, so, uh, but my name is Hunter Levine. I'm the SALT director here, which means I work with our college students that call this church home. And this morning I get the privilege of wrapping up our winter series, Christmas Classics, where we're looking at some of the most popular, iconic Christmas films and the Polar Express as a church. And so uh, we're doing that. And what we're really doing is we're actually looking at our Bibles and how God's truth can speak to the longings and the challenges of our world. That's what's being explored in these movies and music and media. And there's nothing inherently wrong with us to know how the world thinks about these challenges and thinks about these longings. In fact, in many ways, it can be helpful. But as Christians, we, we, wanna, we don't want to look through the lens of media, emotions, intuition. We don't want to blindly trust our hearts or the wisdom of the world. We want to use scripture to guide us. As the psalmist says, we want God's word to be a lamp to our feet. When I was a kid, I lived on a large uh, block of property. And one of the things I loved to do as a kid is to go outside with my dad and have a flashlight. And everything looks different in the dark. And we would shine the flashlight around and we would see what we would find. And Now with my daughters, I like to do that, and they fight about who has the flashlight, but really what the Bible teaches us is that's how we navigate this world. God's word, the scripture, is the flashlight that we use. It's the lens that we use to shine down, and it shows us how we should see things, how we should think about things. One of the passages that we try to really instill in our college students here at City Church is Romans 12, where Paul says this, he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, because of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus has done, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. In response to Jesus Christ, to who he is, present your life to him. And then he gives them this warning, and this is the warning that we need to understand. Do not be conformed to this age. Don't be conformed, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. That we use the scriptures to be a light to shine on these things that we talk about in our culture. Things that are explored in these movies. This morning I get the opportunity to preach on one of the most iconic films, The Grinch. And this is a a great story that many people know and love. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke 15. That's what we're going to be looking at as far as the text this morning. But as you turn there, I just want to take a moment to look at, to look at the Grinch. And, and depending on who you are in this room, when we talk about the Grinch, a couple things might come to mind. If, you, if you're old, this might come to mind. If you're an old person, you might think of this as the Grinch. No offense. If you're young and vibrant and in the, the greatest years of your life, like myself, you might think of this as the Grinch. Jim Carrey. Any Jim Carrey fans? Is this your favorite Grinch? <laughs> And if you're a young child with, with not the best taste, maybe you think of this as the Grinch right here. I don't want to offend anybody, but as a creative writing major uh, at Florida State, and, and I did get a job, which is exciting for creative writing majors, <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about stories and thinking about the stories that we tell and what makes a good story. And underneath the the surface of the stories that we watch are really retellings of even older stories that we know. And these stories are told again and again and again, and they're reimagined over and over because they strike a chord in our own stories. We see ourselves in these stories, and so we tell them and find new ways to tell them. And good stories have a few key elements when you're really thinking about what a good story is. One, good stories have ties to common problems, issues that we face. Good stories have what's called character development, where people within the story change. And it reminds us as as humans of our own desire to see change in our own lives. Good stories have a sense of justice. There's resolution because we have a longing for justice in our lives. We want to see resolution with the issues in our own stories. And in The Grinch, we see all of this unfolding. That's why there's so many different retellings of it. In The Grinch, we see this green, unkept, hairy character living in the mountains, hoarding trash, Frankensteining parts together, making different uh, machines. It's kind of a, a hillbilly or a redneck of sorts, if you really think about it. And so we meet this character, and, and that's where he is. He's in a mountain, but what we really see is we see a character who's failing to fit in. He's an outcast. We're also told that this character has a heart problem, that he also needs change. 
The tension that we see in the movie is something that we call in college ministry the battle of belonging, where this individual is trying to figure out where do I really belong in the world? What do I really need to do with my time, with my life? Where is my place? Who are my people? And really, even though this story takes place during Christmas, it's really a search for acceptance, looking for acceptance. And ultimately, the the resolution of the story is found through a homecoming. And if you watch this film, it's easy to find points of relatability in the character's struggle for acceptance. And it's where we find ourselves actually this morning in the passage in Luke 15, teaching on our own struggle for acceptance and how ultimately we're made right with God. We find acceptance. We find that resolution in Christ himself. So here's Luke 15 as we dive in this morning. The context is this, that all the tax collectors and the sinners were approaching Jesus and listening to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining, saying, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. So Right here in the the beginning of Luke 15, we see two types of people around Jesus. We see these sinners and these tax collectors. These are the people that people would look down upon, the outcasts, people who uh, were seen as the lowlifes at the time. And they were drawing near to Jesus because they wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. They wanted to hear Jesus' teachings. And then we had the religious leaders, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, who were looking at the situation and they were upset because this man who was claiming to be God, who was speaking with authority, was giving attention, was giving love, was showing care for these sinful, dirty, terrible people. And so what happens here in Luke 15 is that Jesus gives us a, a set of parables. And a parable is a simple story that teaches us a divine truth. And Jesus used these a lot. He would use a very simple, easy to understand story to teach us something important and impactful about God's kingdom. And the stories in Luke 15 is a story about a lost sheep, the parable of the 99, also the story of a lost coin. But what I want to look at this morning and want us to think about is this last story, the third story, the story of the lost son. Or maybe we could even say the story of our faithful father. So let's look at that together. Luke 15 starts in verse 11. He also said a man had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets and gave them to them. Not many days later, the young son gathered together all that he had and he traveled to a distant country. This is a son coming to the father saying, you know what? I don't want anything to do with the family. I don't want anything to do with you. All I really want is I just want your money. I could care less if you were dead and I just had my inheritance. I just want to go live my life. I want to go somewhere else. And in the story, we don't get the full game plan that the son had if he was going to go start a business or what he was thinking. But what we see is ultimately he was searching for something that's away, something that's away from his father, something that's away from God. It could be success. It could be money, sex, pleasure, notoriety. But this is what's happening in the story of the prodigal son. He wants to run away. Similarly, this also happens in its own way in the story of the Grinch. We see him run away. He goes to a new house, trying to get toxic people out of his life. He wants new people, new house. He tries comfort. He's inventing all these devices to make his life easier. Maybe if his life could just be easier and laid back and he could be in the right setting and he didn't have toxic people, maybe then everything would be okay. He even tried a new look. If you remember in the Jim Carrey, he shaves. He tries to look better. Maybe that would make him feel good. Maybe he would find acceptance and joy if he could just look better. He even got a dog. Maybe if I could just have an animal or a kid or a spouse or a boyfriend, maybe if I could just add something into my life, maybe then I would find acceptance and peace and joy. And both the stories that we're talking about this morning share the false idea that happiness or joy or acceptance is something that we find away, something that we run to that's not God himself. And what's happening here in the text that we're looking at, the prodigal son, is that Jesus is showing us our own rebellious nature to run away and to turn from God. And often when we read this story, we try to create distance between ourselves and the prodigal son. And really in that sense, we're no different than the Pharisees in the beginning of Luke 15, where we just want to draw these lines and say, that's these types of people, not me. I wouldn't do that, but I, I want to remind us that this is our story. 
But we don't need to create that kind of distance. In Romans 3, Paul tells us there's no one righteous, no, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There's no one who does what is good, not even one. And then Paul, a few verses later in Romans 3.23, says this famous verse, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Jesus Christ. We've all sinned. This is our story. We've all run from God. We've all in our own ways tried to find our own mountains to hide on, our own places to seek joy. It's just like the hymn that we often sing, prone to wander, Lord, I, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. But our story is that we are wandering children who are prone to look for worth and meaning and acceptance away from God. And the story continues in verse 13, it says, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he'd spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. So here's the son, he's run away from home, no, no great life update on the back of the Christmas card. Things are not going well. He finds himself filled with shame, covered in muck, working for somebody who's distant and far away. And the scripture warns us of this thinking because sin is a trap and it's a trail that doesn't lead to where it promises. And this is what's happened with his son. He ran away thinking he would find something good, something better than what he had with his father. And he finds himself longing for the fill from the pods that the pigs were eating. And the son, just like the Grinch, finds himself discontent in a mountain of trash, in the shameful muck of pigs. And the plan to run away, the plan to hide, and to move away from God is not working out, but the story does not end there. Verse 17 tells us this, that when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger. So he comes up with this plan, he says, I'll get up, I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and he went to his father. Many of us in this room, we've had these experiences where we've, we've done something wrong, we've messed up, and so we're coming up with this game plan. How am I going to present this to my dad, to my mom? How am I going to break the news to him? So here he is, he's just thinking, okay, I'm just going to go home, I'm just going to tell him I've sinned, I've messed up, I don't expect you to love me, I don't expect you to call me your son, but if, if I could just work for you, I know that would be better than just laying here with these pigs. But the text tells, tells us, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and he ran and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. Now this is not how society expected a grown man to act. Grown men at the time did not run. It's just like today. There's certain places, certain situations. You see a grown man running, you just start running too. You, just, you get out, okay? There was no on shoes. There was no little short shorts and all that. This is, grown men didn't run at the time. But here's a grown man running to his son. And this is not how the son expected his father to act because this isn't how people treat people. When you mess up, when you rebel against people, when you disgrace them, you don't expect acceptance. So the son, the, that's not how the father should be acting. The son's thinking. And this is what Jesus is showing us, the counter-cultural way of God. This is why the Pharisees were upset because they didn't understand the heart of God. And so Jesus is using this story to show us his heart. And the son said to him, verse 21 says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast, because the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Verse 25 shows us the other brother's experience. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he summoned one of the ser servants, questioning what these things meant. And they told him, your brother is here, and he told them, your father has slaughter slaughtered the fattened calf because of him, that he's safe and sound. Then he became angry, and he didn't want to go in, so his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving for many years for you. I've never disobeyed your orders Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, 
who has devoured your assets with prostitutes and slaughter, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you've always been with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. See, Jesus is trying to say this is the heart of God, that to see the lost saved, to see the rebellious received again. There's a few realities in this text I want us to think about this morning in a season where we're setting goals and we're thinking about what we want to do and what we want to get and it's not bad at all. I don't think there's anything wrong with that to think about what do we want to achieve, what do we want to get, but I want to remind us that, of what we have in Christ because if we set those goals for getting what we have in Christ, it's all for nothing. The first thing that we see in this text that Jesus is teaching is, is this, that we have a family. We have a family, a place where we belong. We, we live in a culture that values independence, and that can be good in many ways because we want to see, as we raise children and we mentor people, we want to see them be independent. We want to see them be financially independent, but it can quickly turn to a blindness on our dependence we have upon God, where Jesus says he is the vine. We are made to be dependent on him. And independence can quickly turn into a, a mask for individualism and self-centeredness. That can cause us to forget that we were made for community. And, and this community, not, not just with one another, not just community with one another, but also with God himself. A relationship with God that Genesis says in the opening is so close before sin enters the world that God is walking with Adam. Not literally, but the closeness of that relationship is like two friends going on a walk together. That we were made to be dependent on God, that we were made to have community with God, to have a relationship with God. And the first thing that I want us to see here in the story is it reminds us of the simple fact that we have a father, that we belong to a family. And I'm not sure what that, that word father, when we talk about God being our father, I don't know what emotions that conjures up in you. And I have a lot of life to live, but I've lived enough life to know that in a room like this, that can mean a lot of different things. Because we live in a broken world, and many people in this room have broken relationships with their father. And when they think about the word father, negative emotions come to mind. Hurt and pain come to mind. But that's not the story of this father. This is a, a loving father who longs to hold his children dear. That's the father that we have. And it also reminds us that we have rebelled that we have ran away from God, that we've looked for purpose and joy and pleasure somewhere else other than in God himself. But this is not just a story about a rebellious child. This is primarily a story about a faithful and loving and caring father who wants to hold his children dear. Satan tells us that we're too dirty, we're too shameful, we've wandered away, God doesn't love us, he, he doesn't want us to come home, that we should just stay in the muck and the pigs, that we should just hide in our own mountains. And maybe if we could just push a little deeper in the mountains, maybe if we could just tweak enough, do enough, change enough, maybe then we'll actually have enough of something to actually fill that void in our hearts. But the scriptures say that in Christ we've been adopted. That in Christ we have a new name. That in Christ we, like this son, we have an inheritance because we are known and loved by our heavenly father despite our rebellion and sin. Think about that. God knows every wrong thing about you. And yet he loves you and he wants to hold you dear. That when we place our faith in Christ, that we receive sonship in him that we become a part of his family. So that's the first thing, that we have a family, a place where we belong, a home that we can go to. The second is this, that we have acceptance. We have acceptance. We didn't just get the title son or daughter, but we're actually now in Christ accepted by our Father. This story helps us to understand a key foundational element of our faith, that in Christ we are fully loved and we're fully accepted. No percentages, no contingencies. In Christ Jesus we are fully loved and fully accepted. In Christmas time, we, we see all these decorations around and probably one of the most popular words that you'll see in houses and, and in light displays and all around us is this word hope. And this story, as, as, the, as the Pharisees would listen to it, as the, as the sinners would listen to it, this is a, a story of 
hope because of who our Father is. So two, two quick things here. First, the cross did not just give us hope for eternity, meaning it didn't just save us and, and, and allow us to spend eternity in the future with the Father, but it also has given us acceptance now. It's not just hope for eternity, but it's also acceptance right now. And this acceptance does not come from our efforts. It doesn't come from us doing enough good things. It doesn't come from us accomplishing enough, uh, meeting enough plans. It doesn't come from any of that. It comes solely from our Savior. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we're glad you're here. We hope that that this will be a place where you can come and better understand what the Bible actually teaches and, and who God is and who we believe God to be and This is important for us to understand that the Bible isn't some sort of book that tells us how to be loved by our Father. The Bible is a book that tells us in Christ Jesus we are already loved by our Father. We have that now. And if you're in this room and you're a Christian, let's just be honest, this is easy for us to forget because we live in a performative culture. We live in a culture where we want to do quote-unquote big things and we want to be quote-unquote good people and and we we want to please our Father, but We need to understand that in Christ Jesus, we are fully loved right now. To understand that God will not love you more this year if you come to church every Sunday, if you're in Christ Jesus. God will not love you more this year if you work more or you work less. If you spend more time with your family or you spend less time with your family. God will not love you. We want you to come to church. We want you to be good workers. We want you to be good parents. But God will not love you more because of those things. But the reason that God will not love you more is because he cannot love you more because in Christ Jesus, you are already fully loved. You are already fully accepted. And it's not because of what you have done. It's not because of what in this year you can do or what you can become. It's because of what Christ has done. You are accepted in him. In the Grinch song, there's this line that says that, You wouldn't touch him with a 39 and a half foot pole. He's just so nasty and just such a a, a terrible person. You wouldn't wouldn't want to be anywhere close to somebody like that. The truth is that you and I, when we look in the mirror, we often think this is God's posture towards us. He wouldn't want to be near me. I mean, this is how the son feels as he comes back to the father, doesn't it? He's not going to want me to be his son. I don't expect him to call me his son. Definitely didn't expect a hug, a robe, a ring, a feast, a celebration. But when we look in the mirror and we think about all the, 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 the shame that we have, all the mistakes that we've made, all the things that we carry with us, we just think, God wouldn't want me. He wouldn't want to hold me. He wouldn't want to call me his son. Yeah, maybe I'm saved, but he wouldn't want to be close. Not with the things that I've done. But if you're like me and you struggle with this, I want to encourage you with what Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, the same letter, I encourage you to study that if you haven't, but the same letter that tells us that we're all sinners and we've all rebelled, we don't seek good. In Romans 8, Paul says this, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Not not an ounce. What's the opposite? You could say there is now acceptance, full acceptance for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is what we have in him. Back to the opening of of Luke 15, the Pharisees in the text, they were grumbling because the sinners were drawing near. They were like the older brother in the story who were upset that that, that the father was celebrating a son who had rebelled and gone away. And rather than celebrating, they they just would sit there in their own arrogance and their own self-righteousness. And as a quick aside, I I just want to say as we think about this story is that this is what self-righteousness and arrogance will do. It will lead to cynicism, and it will lead to you missing out and celebrating what the Lord is doing around you and the grace that he is giving to the people around you and the work and the lives that he's doing to the people around you. This is why self-righteousness, it just robs us of the joy. It just robs us of, of celebrating what the Father is doing. And the brother in the story is not only missing celebrating with his brother, he's missing celebrating with his father. That we should look onto the grace of God. We should see it in people's lives and be drawn to it and be excited for it. Because we aren't any better. We've received acceptance in Christ too. And this leads to the the last thing I want us to see in the story. That we can have real change. The absolute wrong response for us to have is to say that we have acceptance in Christ. So if I'm fully accepted in Christ, I'm just going to go sin and just run away again. 
I'm just going to continue to live the way I'm living. That would be like the son in the story being like, oh, you love me, dad? Okay, I think I'm going to go back to the pigs now, now that I know we're good. No. The beautiful thing is that we have full acceptance in Christ, but, but we also can have change in our life. We can actually move away from these things, that our acceptance in Christ should lead to action in our lives. That action isn't going to make God love us more because we're already fully loved in Christ Jesus, but because we're fully loved in Christ Jesus, we should be moved towards action in our life. And this change has, has two elements. The first way, just like the Grinch, we need, a, we need a heart change. We need a heart change. And our problem is not that our heart is too small and we just need to be a little bit better. The, the scriptures tell us that our heart is stone, that we're spiritually dead. But in Christ Jesus, we can have life in him. That's the first thing. That's the first hope of change is that we're not left dead in our sins, but because of the work of Jesus Christ, we can have a new heart, not of stone. But secondly, we can have change through what's called sanctification, which is a big word that, that means us becoming more and more like Jesus. And this is what God does. When he saves his children, he begins, just like any loving father would do, he begins to shape us. And he begins to make us more and more and more like Jesus. And yes, we will still sin. And yes, we will still make mistakes. But our life should be one of repentance where we move closer and closer and we long to be more and more like Jesus. A while back, and I don't hear this phrase as much with the college students that we work with, now, but for a long time in, in Western Christianity, you would hear this phrase, I rededicated my life. And I think the sentiment behind that, I think, is great, which is somebody just saying, look, I, I, I just had a wake-up call in my life, and I'm going to be living for Jesus again. And that's great. But, but the reality is the Christian life is one where every day we should wake up and rededicate our life to him. Because we do have a heart that's prone to wander. Because we are like that son who's drawn to run away. And so every day we need to be repenting and turning from our sin and rededicating ourselves and reminding ourselves of our loving Father and striving to live for Him. Saying, this is not what a son should do. This isn't who I am. I mean, that was the moment the son had when he was eating with the pigs. He's going, what am I doing? This is not who I am. I want to come home. And this is what the Christian walk is every single day, reminding ourselves of who we are and what we have in Christ Jesus. We are loved children who are accepted in him. And we're children who can change. We don't have to stay in the same place. It's like I like goals, and I'm very pro goals. I do think it's funny that like, we act like there's a huge opportunity right now to set goals that we didn't have a week ago. <laughs> You could have set a goal a week ago, you know? And that's great. Like, I'm not making fun of goals. I'm just making fun of the idea that now we think we have the opportunity to make a goal. You can just make a goal any time. But the beautiful thing about this time of year right now as we sit here and we think about our goals is it reminds us that we are able to change. There's a quick theology lesson here. God is what's called immutable, meaning he, he cannot change because he's perfect. You can't change something that's perfect. To change it would be to make it less. So God is immutable. He is not going to change. But we, as creatures, as his creation, are mutable, meaning that we are able to change, and it's actually a really good thing. It brings us a lot of hope. Because as we sit here and we think about all the ways that we want to change and we want to see, we want to save more money, we want to lose more weight, we want to do all these things, and those are all great things, and I hope that all those things happen. I hope you understand, too, that the sin in your life and the things in your life that you think you could never overcome, you can in Christ. We can have change in him. And so as we think about this story of a son who, who comes back to the father and is met with love and acceptance, I want to ask you, who are you in this story? My daughters, when they watch movies, if you have kids, they probably do this to you, or maybe you remember doing this as a kid. They have like full-blown arguments about who is who in the movie. <laughs> I'm Elsa. No, I'm Elsa. You're like, oh, oh great. Uh, here we go, right? Because you both can't pretend to be the same person as you watch the movie. But we do that, right? When we're watching these Christmas movies, when we're reading the scriptures, we often ask ourselves, like, wh where do I see myself? Where do I see truths in my own life coming out in this story? Maybe for you, as you look at this story, you see a lot of yourself as the rebellious son who needs to come home and be reminded of who you are. And those voices in your head that say that God doesn't love you, that you're too sh shameful, that you're too filthy, that's not from the scriptures. That's why they call Satan the accuser. That's not God. And maybe for you, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ and realize that he does love you. 
How much so? So much that he would give his life on the cross in your place so that when God looks at you, he doesn't see all the mistakes you make. He sees the perfect life of his son on the cross. Maybe as you read this story, that's you. Maybe you're in this room and truthfully you're connecting and reminding yourself a lot of the the arrogant older brother who needs to remember the grace he has in his own life. And maybe there are people that God's placed around you that you're looking down on that your own self-righteousness and your own arrogance is causing you to miss out on the joy of seeing what God is doing around you. Or maybe you're in this room and you're somebody who knows the Lord, but you currently have an opportunity to love and forgive and embrace someone in your life just like the Father. It's one of the beautiful privileges we get as Christians is to reflect God's love to people around us. And one of the great things about the new year is it gives us a new opportunity often to try to restore relationships. And maybe for you, there's someone in your life that you need to hold, that you need to forgive. But it's a reminder of all of us this year that the thing that we really need is not some sort of small change, some, so, some sort of small tweak, but that we're all in the same boat. We need Christ. And that's where we'll find our acceptance in him. And as a church, this is why we say we're for the gospel and for the city, because this is what we want to make known. In a world that's constantly searching for that thing that's going to make their life okay, that's going to make their life better, we get the opportunity as a church to lift up Christ. So I want to encourage us to do that. Let's pray together and we'll take the Lord's Supper. Father, we're so grateful, God, for your word that reminds us that you're a loving Father who in Christ Jesus has given us acceptance. And Father, we're grateful that through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the guidance of your word that we are people who can change. So Father, I pray that as you continue to work in this church that you would help us to be people who have deep roots in that gospel. Father, I pray that you would also allow us to have a passion for lifting up the hope of Jesus Christ in a world that's looking everywhere but to find it. Father, for the person in this room who hasn't placed their faith in you, I pray that you would help them to understand and see the goodness of your gospel and that they would do that today. Father, for the person in this room who's struggling with self-righteousness and arrogance, often like I do, Father, I pray that you would help them to be humbled by the cross and that they would join in the celebration of the work that you're doing around them. And Father, for the person in this room who needs to forgive and to hold tight, Father, I pray that you would give them the strength to do that despite how much hurt as they've experienced in their life. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to study your scriptures this morning, to sing your truth, and we ask that you continue to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.